you have your Bibles this morning, let me encourage you to turn to the book of Malachi. We have been in a series uh, for several weeks now studying the book of Malachi. The title of the series is Getting God Upside Down. And how so much of our life gets turned upside down when our view of God is wrong. We spent a few moments in the first five verses looking at the background and and, and dealing with the first objection in Malachi's day, that because they got God upside down, they thought, God doesn't love me. As a matter of fact, God says I loved you, and they challenge him. Oh, yeah, well, how? And so he, we went through that, and, and just that reminder that when we see God right side up, we understand he loved us so much, he sent his own son to die in our place. And that is amazing. For any of us that have kids, as frustrated as you might get with your kids at times, you probably would not send them to a cross for a bunch of people who would not accept it um, or appreciate it. Um, And then we looked at uh, the next few verses um, that when you get your view of God upside down, it kind of reduces God's size in your mind. Um, When you get your thoughts about God upside down, it, it makes you think God really isn't that big a deal. And we saw that because over and over we saw, he says, you're despising me. And we said the word there for despise literally means to think less of. And so they were, they were offering God blind, sick, and lame animals, um, and they were really just kind of shoving off on God everything they didn't have a use for because God just wasn't that big a deal. That actually is going to relate a little bit to the message today, but th- we looked the next week at, uh, in 10 through 16 of chapter 2, when we get our view of God upside down, we think that God only cares what I do when I'm at church. And he doesn't care what I do at home. We said, we gave some examples of that. And we said, how many of you have ever heard the saying, uh, or heard a kid corrected at church? Uh, we don't lie at church. Evidently, we do everywhere else, but not at church. We don't steal at church. We don't write on the walls at church. We do that uh, everywhere else. But we looked at that and ha- we saw how God, God loves us. And God is already in tomorrow, just like he's still in yesterday. And no matter where we go, from the highest mountain to the lowest valley, no matter where it is, he's there. And while that might seem like a threat to children, God's always watching, it's actually a great comfort because it means, no, we can't go anywhere outside of his awareness, care, and concern. And then we spent uh, some time last week uh, in verses, uh, chapter 2, verse 17 through chapter 3, verse 6, Uh, where the people had gotten their view of God upside down, and they actually began to think, it seems like God blesses the evil. God blesses the people who do wrong. We talked a little bit about how at times, if we're not careful, we can look at those who seem to get away sometimes literally with murder, while the rest of us get a ticket when we go two miles over the speed limit. And we said that sometimes if we're not careful, we get our view of God upside down. We end up like the story of the rich man and Lazarus where the rich man got all his good stuff and Lazarus got nothing and had sores and lived under the rich man's table and only ate what he threw on the floor. We want to look at that story and we say, surely what Jesus was talking about in that story is that Lazarus should not have been treated that way. But that's not the message of that story. The message of the story is... You can get your good stuff now and suffer for eternity, or you can suffer a little now for the sake of Christ and spend eternity with him. That brings us to where we are in chapter 3, verses 7 through 12 today. And the title of the message is, when you get your view of God upside down, it's real easy to think, God doesn't deserve my money. God doesn't deserve my money. After all, I'm the one who worked for it. I'm the one who earned it. I'm the one who saved it. I'm the one who goes to work every day. I'm the one who generates it. I'm the one who produces it. I'm, it's, it's, it's mine. I, God doesn't deserve my money. And what we're going to see today by looking at this is while 
Malachi used the example of money, we could apply this to a lot of areas of life. So I know some in the room are gonna say, great. I just came to this church, and all they ever talk about is money. Come back next week, it won't be about money. But if you have your Bibles, let me encourage you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word as we read chapter three, verses seven through 12. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. You say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse for you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Father, as we study your word this morning, Remove any distractions. Help us to hear directly from you. Take away any any defensiveness we might feel and help us to just be open to what you have to say. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So a little background before we jump into this passage. By the way, can I just tell you that uh, for some people, this might be the most familiar part of the book of Malachi. Um, I know a lot of churches uh, will do a a stewardship emphasis once a year, and they'll preach on tithing or on giving, uh, and so they'll spend a lot of time here. Um, This whole this whole idea of preaching through a book of the Bible means that when you come to t- these topics, you have to include them. You can't just dodge the issue. But what I want us to see today, and I, what I hope we'll hear today, is that what God is talking about here goes far beyond just money. Amen. Now, here's what it, the background. The people had moved back f- to, into the promised land from being in exile. And they had listened to Jeremiah, they had listened to Isaiah, they had listened to Ezekiel, uh, actually in exile, talk about how one day they were going to come back to the land and everything was going to be good. We know some of those passages, the, the lion will lay down with the lamb, and those passages from Isaiah. And the problem is, they got back, and immediately when they get back, if you go back to Haggai and Zechariah, they get back and they get settled and they just kind of settle into this is the life we have. But it's not that, that promise of, of prosperity, that promise of peace, all that that they had been told would come. And so they begin to settle back and start to just take care of themselves. God sends Haggai and Zechariah to tell them to rebuild the wall and rebuild the temple, and and they get those things done. But even after that, they still face opposition. And they're going, we don't understand that. How We thought it was supposed to be good. The problem is, and we find this with prophecy in the Bible quite a bit, is that if you look at a mountain range, it looks like you have all these mountains just kind of in a row or in a line, right? But when you drive perpendicular to the mountains, what you actually find is one might be miles in front of the other. And so while some of the predictions of peace and prosperity were to be realized after return from exile, what they didn't realize was that it wasn't all going to happen at once. As a matter of fact, we know some of the promises of peace and prosperity about the child being able to play over a cobra's den and not be harmed and the lion and the lamb lying down together, we know will actually come in the millennial kingdom, which is later, even to us. But they had settled into this, into this life with, and they thought they had a better idea of how to provide and care for themselves than God did. That at this time that Malachi writes, they're going through a, a famine. And so it's a time where their crops are not producing. What they have is being stolen. And so 
They thought they knew how to better themselves. They could take care of themselves. And the easiest way to take care of yourself when times are lean is to cut anything out of your budget that doesn't benefit you. Well, what do you think they cut out? We know earlier they had been offering animals and sacrifices. They had been coming and offering, but they had been substituting the sick and the lame and the blind, those with running, oozing sores, and give them to God instead of the first one that crosses under the beam like it's supposed to be. But by this point, sometime later, now they've given up on the idea of giving to God at all. Because they think, we've got to take care of ourselves. We know how to better ourselves. We know how to defend ourselves against the invaders. We'll keep all the stuff that we have. That way we can sell them. We can get more wood. We can get more rocks. We can get more uh, mortar. We can get more things to work together to build our defenses and take care of ourselves. And they thought, you know, by doing that, what we're doing is separating ourselves from the rest of the world, and and we'll show them that we're different than they are by the way that we build our high walls and the way that we take care of ourselves and stay detached. What they didn't realize was in that process of ignoring God, they had actually grown so distant from God that they didn't even realize how wrong they were. Now, I know that no one here has ever had times when you wandered away from the Lord. But if you did, the challenge with that becomes the further you get and the more comfortable you get, the harder it is to come back. Because you know what happens? First of all, the enemy whispers in your ear that you have failed God and he's disappointed with you and he could never accept you back. When here's the reality, it's him drawing you. It's him, he's the one saying, this distance between us is not good. It's not good for you. So come home. The enemy tries to throw shame on your back and convince you God won't accept you when what God really wants more than anything is for you to crawl crawl up in his lap and say, Daddy, I'm sorry I did it again. That's where the people were. They were distant from God and they thought everything was okay. And then God comes along with this message. And the message is, return. 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 Return to me, and I will return to you. See, there's always that question. I don't know if any of you have ever been on the outs with your parents or on the outs with one of your kids or on the outs with a friend. But in human relationships, there's always jeopardy. There's always that question of will, if I reach back out across the way to this person, will they rebuff my attempts at reconciliation? And I certainly don't want to make things worse, right? So sometimes what we do is we settle into this stalemate, right? I'm not moving to you. You're not moving to me. This is just where we're going to be. The problem is we we put that kind of thinking on God. And we assume because maybe we tried to reconcile a friendship and it wouldn't be reconciled that God doesn't want to be reconciled with us. And that is a lie. Because what does he say to them? Return. Now think about this. They had chosen to deceive and defraud God by giving him these lame animals and things before. And now they had chosen to, literally the word for rob God here in verse 8 means to take something by force. They had stolen from God. And what was his message? Come on back. Now we could stop right there and we'd have a great message, wouldn't we? Wouldn't we? Because here's the reality. No matter how far you've gone from God, it's one step back. It's the step of repentance. 
a changing of your mind that produces a change of attitude and produces a change of action. And God will take you back. And the amazing thing is, he doesn't hold it over your head. He doesn't say, you messed up. I'm going to forgive you this time, but I'm keeping my eye on you. Because I know you're going to mess up again. He says, no, I'm keeping my eye on you because I love you. And because you're family. And because you're accepted. So his message is return to me and I'll return to you. And, and by the way, just in case we think that this is an isolated incident, just consider that in Zechariah, a few years before this, he said, therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you. And if you want to say that's Old Testament, let's jump into James chapter 4, verse 8. It says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's what God wants. It's what, it's what you need. And whether you're coming to him from your sin for the very first time and making Jesus the Lord of your life, or whether you've messed up a hundred times, he says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. But he doesn't stop there. We have this idea that maybe God would say, return to me and I'll return to you. And we'll just have this, we'll just be in the same room, but we won't talk or we won't be close or anything. But he goes beyond that when he says not only that, but trust me and I'll provide for you. What were they going through? What was the difficulty? They had famine. They, had, they didn't have any crops. Things weren't producing. They didn't, that was their wealth. By the way, if you have trouble imagining that, just take a look at your 401k. It's now maybe a 201K. But God says, trust me. And I'll provide for you. Look at, look at what he says. Will a man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. You say, how have we robbed you? He says, in tithes and offerings. Now, the, the, the technical term here that he's talking about is two different things. Tithes, the word tithe literally means tenth. So he's talking about the tenth. The, the tithe that, by the way, we'll see in just a minute, was not part of the law, came before the law. And it was part of the law, and then Jesus affirmed it after the law. But the second one, the offerings, is actually, the word is teruma. It literally means the tithe of the tithe. So what happened if you were Jewish during Malachi's day, you brought the first of every 10 animals to the Lord and gave it to the temple and then they took out of those animals the first out of every 10 they were given and gave them to the high priest so that he could focus on just being connected to God. In our day, we, t we call tithes that 10% of our offering or that 10% of our income, 10% of what God increases you with is what we consider a tithe. And for us, offerings are anything that God lays on your heart above that. Whatever it might be that he inspires you to give to. It might be, it might be a parachurch ministry that, that ministers to a group of people that you feel really connected to or concerned for. It might be another ministry of the church that you feel God is leading you to give. Like every, every two or three times a year, we take up various mission offerings. The, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering that goes to international missionaries. And the, the Annie Armstrong Easter offering that goes to North American missionaries. And the, the, um, the I forget the name of the local state one. We just did it. Um, and that goes to the state of Oklahoma and the work that God is doing here. Or it may be that God inspires you to be involved in, in giving to something else, but that offering for us in our day is that that God inspires above the tithe. Now, the, the objection is tithing is part of the Old Testament law, and it's not for us today, but look at these examples. First of all, tithing came before the law. Abram, when he went and fought King Keterleomer and defeated him and brought back Lot and all his possessions... He met a king named, named Melchizedek. His name literally means 
king of righteousness. He was the king of a place called Salem, which means peace. And he met him there on the road, and Abram recognized Melchizedek as a priest of God and gave him 10% of everything he brought back. And Abram became Abraham. Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob's name gets changed to Israel, but before his name was Israel, Jacob, while running from his murderous brother, whom he had stolen the blessing from and tricked him out of the birthright, promises God that if you take care of me, and you bring me back home, this stone which I've set up as a pillar will be your house, and of all that you give me, I'll give a tenth to you, the tenth, that's the word tithe. And so Jacob became Israel. Israel was the nation that God calls out of Egypt and gives them the law so they can become a nation of a sovereign, theocentric nation instead of a nation of slaves. So Jacob is before the law. Now we do have the tithe as part of the law. Leviticus 27, 32 says, for every 10th part of herd or flock, whatever passes under the rod, the 10th one shall be holy to the Lord. But we also know, looking forward into the New Testament, that Christ himself, when criticizing the Pharisees, said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you're hypocrites. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin, but have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These things you should have done without neglecting the other. See, this is what they would do. They would say, okay, somebody gave me a new car. I can put it in my God pocket, or I can put it in my me pocket. It's in my God pocket. When my parents call and say, I need a ride to the doctor, I say, well, I'm sorry, I don't have a car. God does. But I can't help you out. They did that with their money. They had two bags. They would tie one to one side of them and one to the other. And when they had money and they didn't want to help somebody, they would reach into their bag and put it over in God's bag. And when somebody came and said, hey, hey, buddy, can you spare a $5 for a cup of coffee? They would say, oh, man, I don't have any money on me because it's all over here in the God bucket. And Jesus said, you guys are so careful. to You, you, you sort out the, the leaves of mint that you have and you give every tenth one of those to the Lord. But yet you neglect using everything you have to serve God. You should tithe, yes, but also take care of people. And then we know even in the early church, in 1 Corinthians 16 too, where they were told on the first day of every week, each of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. What Paul was saying there to them was the early Christians went to the temple and tithed and then they came to church and they gave another tithe. Because they wanted to honor God. They were Jewish, and so they wanted to honor God and obey the law, but they wanted to go beyond that and honor God by honoring him in the church. So so I say all that to say that God says to them here, trust me and I'll provide for you. They were in a famine, and they said, you know what? I've got to take care of me. So they said, God, I'm sorry, but all the pie's gone. There's nothing left for you. And God said, you don't understand how that should not be. Now, let's take it off the topic of money, which clearly is the topic here. But it can apply to time. God, I I don't have time to serve you. I mean, by the time I work and then work extra and then pour myself into my hobbies and by the time I hang out with my buddies and by the time I try to come home and, and 
try to be with the people that are at home, if there is anybody, and then I do laundry and take care of all that. God, by the time I get all that done, if I were to give you time to serve you by, by actually going to my neighbor and talking with them or, or spending time in your word or serving in some way, I, I wouldn't have enough sleep. Do you know what the enemy does because he knows that's a reality? He fills our lives up with stuff. So we have no margin. I would stop and give that person a ride that's walking down the road, but I've got to hurry up and get to my next appointment. You know who that sounded like in the Good Samaritan story? That sounded like the priest and the Levite that Jesus said, that's not good. Or maybe we do it with our creativity and our focus. Our employer, our, our hobbies, our friends, our family get the best of us and we just, we just make it to church and we just, poof, I'm here. And we hear announcements about working with kids and we think that's a passion I really have, but I've used it up everywhere else. I don't have anything left for here. Or you see that, that neighbor that's, that's struggling Maybe they lost a mate. Maybe their kids are wayward, whatever. They live in the next house or they live in the next apartment or whatever it might be. And you, and you say, man, I really feel like I need to go over there and, and, and give them some of my time or give them some of my, my care, but yet I'm just pouring out all the time and I feel empty. I have nothing to give. What's God's answer for that? Trust him. Look at these verses. You are cursed with a curse, for you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so there may be food in my house, and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I'll not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Now I know somebody here is saying, I remember Jesus saying when tempted... not to test God. And yet he says here, and I've highlighted it for you so you can see it clearly, bring the whole tithe in the storehouse so there may be food in my house and test me now in this. Just so you don't think I'm wrong, Deuteronomy 6.16 says that you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So how do we reconcile those two things? Don't put the Lord to the test. And he says, test me when it comes to tithes and offerings. I'll give you a little Hebrew lesson. When God says, test me now in this, it's the word bachan. It literally means to test something for its purity or worth. What God says is, you think you have to take care of you, and that's the best way? Try me. See how valuable I am. See how I will take care of you. There's no risk in that for God. Because there's no way it's not going to happen. I know that's terrible English, but there isn't any way it's not going to happen. That's still bad. But in Deuteronomy 6.16, it's the word nasa, and there it means to test somebody, like to make them prove themselves or to, to show their weakness. God never says, assume I'm weak and give me an opportunity to prove it because that would be a lie and God doesn't lie. So what's he say? What's he saying by this? He's saying, look, you want, you, you know that you need to tithe. You know that you need to give offerings and yet you're, you're holding back because you think if you give, you're not gonna have enough for you. I'll tell you what, give and show that I'm right. I'll tell you a little my, our story, very quickly. So my wife and I, when we first got saved, I was in the Navy. I was at E-nothing. I made nothing. Well, I, that's not true. I made $1,300 a month. And uh, we were in a church that taught tithing. Uh, that was one of the first concepts they taught a new believer. And so we knew we needed to do it. We just couldn't. It was, it was just hard because we lived paycheck to paycheck. 
And uh, we, we just didn't know how we were going to do it. And we just felt, finally, God just dealt with us and said, look, just do it. Just, just write me that $130 check, put it in the offering plate, and I will take care of you. I will tell you, we wrote that check, and with trembling hands, the offering plate came by, and we dropped it in. And I will tell you this, there has never been a time when God hasn't provided what we've needed, not what we wanted. And there have been times, literally, where we have run out of food and didn't know where the next meal was coming from, and somebody showed up. There was one time when we had... We lived about 18 miles from town and we were out of gasoline for Ken to be able to go to her teaching job. I was waiting on the church to decide if I, they were going to call me as their pastor or not. And we were out of food and gasoline and she needed to get to work. And when we came outside the door that day, there was an envelope tucked in our door with money in it. We have no idea who it came from. Except that it came from the Lord. Amen. Now, am I gonna, can I sit here and say, if you trust God... By tithing, as he's laying on your heart, that there won't be moments when you feel like, Mother Hubbard, I won't promise you that. But I will promise this. If you're involved in a church, and you're following the Lord's direction, and you're giving as he directs, part of being involved in that church is being open with each other. And I promise you this, just a quick non-scientific poll. How many of you have enough food in your house for more than your next meal? Yeah. So I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands on this, but I, but, I, but I think I know this church well enough to know that if Gene came to church and said, we don't have any food left because we gave money to the Lord and we're, we're out of food, Gene wouldn't be out of food. Now, if Gene was too proud to tell everybody that he was out of food, he might be without food. But the point that God is making here, and I think the point he's making to us today, is we need to trust him and let him provide. I'm going to be honest with you. Most of us, this is going to sound really bad, so hear me out. Don't, don't shut me off. Most of us act like we don't need God. Hang on, hang on. Because if I need something I don't have the money for, I have this little plastic card in my back pocket. Right? And I could just use it, and I may pay it later. I sign my name on the bottom of a little slip that says, I promise I'll pay you. But, but many times we don't even have to pray. or We think we don't. Because I can just get it now and pay later. Now I'm not saying, I'm not bashing credit cards. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. But here's what I'm saying. What I am saying is sometimes we need to trust God. Even in a room this size, with just this number of people, there are enough resources probably to meet any need. And the Lord is the only reason we would share that way. So he says, trust me, and I'll provide for you. He says, put me first, and I'll multiply your efforts. That's what he talks about. He says, he says, test me now in this, verse 10, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Now, this is not name it and claim it. This is not prosperity doctrine. This is not if you'll just put a 10 spot in the offering plate, God promises you a $100 bill back. That's not, that's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about here is when you put God first, he'll multiply your efforts. That's what, that's what the word blessing here means. It comes from a root word, which means to be useful. And so if you trust God, if you put him first, 
He'll multiply your efforts. If you trust God with the best of your time, whether it's in the morning, at night, whatever time is best for you, but spend that time in his word, he'll take the rest of the time you have that day and make it more useful. If you give God the first of your talents, he'll take those talents and he'll multiply them and make them more useful. That's what he's saying here in this passage. It, by the way, it's a New Testament concept too because Matthew 6, a verse we all probably know or many of us know very well. Seek ye first, sorry, I memorized it in King James. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. Put him first. Instead of honestly a lot of times, whether it is time, whether it's effort, whatever it might be, we tend to give God what's left. I had somebody ask me one time, so how do you do this whole tithe thing? What, what, what does that look like? So I get my paycheck, and after, they, after Uncle Sam has gotten his chunk, and after insurance has come out, and after all my things that I have direct paid out of my paycheck, then I take 10% of that, right? Here's, here's what... It seems to me, I'm, I don't pretend to be the brightest crayon in the box, but it seems to me putting God first would mean first. Amen. And I, I just want to you to know, and I hope you do, but my allegiance is first to him. Amen. As much as I appreciate and love living in this country, this is not my home. He is. So I'm not going to tell you how to do that. I'm not even going to be the Holy Spirit to you to tell you what God is telling you about giving this morning, whether it's of your time, your talents, or your treasures. But what I will tell you is, if you'll put him first, he'll multiply your efforts. He says, look to me for protection and you'll have it. Look at verse 11. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you so it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes. And by the way, when God tells you his name, it means something. Look at his name there. He says, Lord of hosts. Now, if you're the type, that has, if you have the type of Bible that, that capitalizes the word Lord, it'll have a capital, big capital L, and the rest are little capitals. What that's telling you is God is using his personal name there, yod heh vav -Heh, it's Jehovah, it's I am that I am that he told Moses at the burning bush. He says, I am the God, and by the way, of hosts is a military term saying, I am the God who's in charge of all the armies of heaven, and if you'll trust me, and if you'll put me first, and if you'll look to me for protection, I have the resources to take care of you. Amen. And by the way, that's in all areas of life. Because he promised to be a husband to the widow and a father to the fatherless. The problem is When you really get down to it, you can't afford not to tithe. Gary Smith, in his commentary on this passage, said, the Western world promotes greed and consumption rather than generosity and stewardship. Since the world tells us the money is ours, we can then make determinations about how we spend the money. Since our own comforts and appetites battle constantly for control, tithes and offerings can be a powerful countercultural step towards winning the battle over self. Putting God first sometimes will mean I can't do everything I want to do. But that's true about anything, right? You put God first in your life and he says, here's the deal. You're married to one man or you're married to one woman and that's the way it is. You don't go running around with other people. You don't look at other people. That is the person that you are to spend your life with. God says, I know that you want money, but the way to get that is not to reach into your neighbor's pocket. <laughs> and when we put God first, it reminds us that he rules 
all areas of our lives. The problem is there really are, according to the Talmud, which is a kind of a rabbinical commentary on the text, it's, it, the Talmud says there's four kinds of people. There is what's yours is mine. That's a taker. What's yours is yours. That's the matcher. That's the person that says, you, you know, you have what's, you, what's yours is yours. You just keep it. What's mine is mine. I keep it. And then you have what's mine is yours. That's the giver. By the way, what, which one of those categories do we find God in? See, here's the thing. The enemy wants to tell you that the issue of tithing or the issue of service or the issue of whatever is God taking your money. God is a taker. When the reality is God is a giver. Amen. By the way, where did your money come from? Where did it come from? Say, well, I earned it. Well, who gave you the muscle? Well, I earned it. Who gave you the brain? And if we want to get really personal, did you choose to be born in a nation where you would be free and be able to work? God is a giver. And God could have said, I get 90% and you get 10. But God doesn't need what you have. But he knows you need to give it. So he says, he says, look to me for protection and you'll have it. And then lastly, he says, walk with me and you'll show the world just who you are and more importantly, just who I am. By the way, if you're the type that likes to do studies, let me encourage you to do a study on this phrase. Then they will know that I am the Lord. And you will find that scattered throughout the Bible. Why? Because God's a giver. He wants you to know him. He wants you to experience him. He wants you to experience his work and provision in your life. He wants you to feel his comfort. He wants you to know his forgiveness. Look at verse 12. I must have thought it was really important because I listed 12 twice. <laughs> All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. See, here's the thing. We're so afraid that if we put God first in our lives, we're going to look weird and people are not going to accept us. When here's the reality, they need to see holy people. So what about you? Are you trusting God to provide for you? I don't know if you sense it right now. But there's a weight in this room. Do you feel that? Because while God chose to talk about money, he could have chosen a dozen different topics and it would still be the same. Have other things or people began to crowd God out of first place in your life? You say, well, I would, I'd follow Jesus with all my heart, but that, that person's really hurt me. And I know I'm supposed to forgive. But I just can't. Or maybe you say, I know that what that person's involved in is not where I need to be. But I want that relationship so bad that I can't turn loose. See, everybody's temptations are different. What may be a temptation to, to Bill has no bearing at all on Bill. And what's a temptation to TJ may hold no interest at all for Keith. And so the enemy knows you. 
And he knows what to tempt you with. And what God is saying today to you by talking about money of all things is, don't you think it's time that you said yes to Jesus and no to whatever's holding you back? Taking matters into your own hands because you don't trust God to protect you is not the answer either. It wasn't for them and it's not for us. I guess really when it comes down to it, what kind of person are you and what will you do? When it comes to money, Mark Batterson, who wrote a book I just finished, which is a really good book called Please, Sorry, and Thanks, Three Words That Can Revolutionize the World. It says when it comes to possessions, don't accumulate possessions, accumulate experiences. Raise your standard of giving, not your standard of living. And remember, you can't outgive God, but you can sure enjoy trying. What area of your life is the enemy trying to crowd God out of? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that it instructs and challenges and corrects. Father, we, uh, every person in this room, I assume has heard you speak to their heart about something and we are or I am humbled I'm humbled to consider that you deserve absolute allegiance in every and all areas of my life and Father I want you to be not just number one amongst competing interests, but I want you to be my life. And I pray, Father, because I know that gathered in this room, there are some people who have yet to meet you through a relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray today, I know this is a challenging message, and I know it struck at the cords of our hearts, but Father, I pray that today they would give up the fight, stop resisting, and give you all that they are. But Father, I know there are some people in this room too that whether it's finances, whether it's time, whether it's their treasures, uh, whether it's just protecting their heart, they're holding things back from you. And I pray, God, that we would test you in this and know that you're going to pass the test and so father whatever you're laying on our hearts to give up or to take on we pray that the answer would be yes father i pray too because i know that there are some people here that feel like they're in a season of life where you have let them down Father, they want to believe. They're just struggling so hard. I pray, God, that today they would find someone that loves them and is willing to pray for them in this place. So, Father, during this invitation, I pray that you would bring people to, not just to a person on a seat, but to you. And I pray it in Jesus' name.